It's great to be back. It's been one hell of a year for all of us. Some of this presentation is going to be a little jaded and cynical, but there's a purpose behind it. But really, this guy here probably is one of the most, to me in science, one of the most in influential people who ever lived. John and I had a 14-year relationship, and he never ever told me any information directly. I had to figure it out on my own, just like everybody else. And so now, I have this stuff figured out. Over Unity is incredibly easy, and I find it totally apropos that the Ferris wheel is sitting there, because in 2002, that's one of the first of John's toys I ever got to play with. And see, John knew all about this stuff, and he didn't, I mean, 12 years later, he's showing me, right, he didn't just come out and tell me anything. I had to earn it. And so that's why this demonstration is in that spirit of John making people bend their minds so the knowledge sets, it changes their thinking. And so John doesn't haunt me. I'm just not going to come out and tell you at all exactly how to make this stuff work because he'll come back and haunt me if I do. And so here it is. I'm here laying a new trail of breadcrumbs. It's, it's so easy in today's world to build practical and powerful zero prime mover energy generators. So if you desire to have free energy in your life, then harness some of the emotional intelligence and the discipline to learn the skills that you need. Then put your will to work, creating workable energy machines because it's right there. You can all do it. Setting yourself free with free energy takes effort and willpower. Remember, there's no hope for the lazy, one of John's favorites. My challenge to you all is this. I will lay out an educational trail of breadcrumbs on the SGM for the people with the will and desire to claim their birthright to have and use prime mover free energy. You'll be almost completely on your own when it comes to technical designs details. If you don't know Ohm's Law and basic electronics, it's up to you to learn. Electron behavior is impeccable, except when you manipulate electrons to not be so impeccable. And that's the whole thing about why these machines work. You can examine them electromagnetically, the input, the shaft output, and all you get is a 20% efficient pulse motor. But if you take Newman, you take John stuff, this has been documented. Dr. Hastings' study of Joseph Newman's machine, you can read it all. Highly influential and highly honest academic who did incredible testing on his machine in comparison to DC, um, DC motors drawn exactly the same watts and Newman's machine, the batteries would run down but they would faithfully over time produce 10, 20, 30 times that the standard motor did because it just run the batteries right down to a massive current, the whole deal. Joe's machine would draw the same current, use the same wattage, but for some reason those damn batteries just kept going and going and going. Nobody paid a lick of attention to it. But time and time again, the same results are reproduced and I've reproduced it time and time again. Figuring this stuff out, it is actually incredibly simple once you understand the nature of time. So what I'm going to go into a little bit about these machines here is there's two things always common to them. They're always pulse DC. They always cause stress by rapid switching processes. And they always have magnetic paths that blow flux off into space. And the more flux you have in space, the better they work. And so imagine this, there's 18 elements to this machine. And when it's running, I could show you the battery, you know, if I had the right test set up, I could show you how the batteries take a long time to discharge. But think of that machine had 18 elements around it. And you had 18 times the flux in space, because here's a solenoid coil. Even though you got an iron core, 
That flux still has to travel in space, and what's in space? The ether. And the more flux you drive into space, that's the price you pay. So with that thing, the 80% of the energy that's lost in that thing to the solenoid coil and the flux in space is actually the price you're paying to manipulate time and to drive that flux into open space, which, since space isn't permeable, you pay a price to do it. And the scientists would tell you, well, you just lost all that flux. Well, no, you didn't. So what you did, you conditioned space. The flux comes from the electrons. And here's the deal with electrons. And Tesla said this. I've reproduced virtually every Tesla experiment ever on John's website to prove exactly what he was saying about Tesla did the same thing. All his manifestations of free energy, all of it was about interrupting electron behavior. Like I say, everybody I know that's done this has never been a dime, made a dime, and they've been beat with clubs, and the general public just can't get it, and that's the big deal. So, I had to take a copy of this page. I think this has been up for at least 20 years. And, uh, and virtually, I've taken all, everything on this particular page. Tesla talking about radiant energy is dead on. I mean, it is dead on. In 2012, I showed how, on this page, talks about how Tesla got on to the, the ether force was by working for Edison in his big DC systems. In 2012, I demonstrated to show how you could take long DC current or circuits with a lot of cabling in them, and you could compare that to a resistive load. And faithfully, Ohm's law applied to my 40 ohms of wire, and the resistor exactly the same. But the plasma arc with a DC that I could create with just copper rods would be four to five times larger than the one off with the resistor current limiter. You're looking at it, it's all exactly the same Ohm's law. So how comes I have four more, four more times the plasma and heat and light than I do with the resistor? And that was exactly what Tesla discovered working for Edison. And then it goes on and on and on. So Tesla used high voltage to do this electron interruption. And he used sanding waves on Tesla coils to create massive voltages. And then he had these incredible spark gap switches that would be running counter, to counter to each other on motors with magnetic dampeners to get exactly what he wanted, a high impulse switch. Boom. And when it fired, the electrons would be driven up against the resistance in the wire, and it would warp their behavior and he would manifest all these different things, from light to heat to everything, and it all depended on the pulse rate and the various ways he was manipulating the electrons. And don't look at these as energy machines, look at them as time-space machines. Thanks, folks. Oh, you Couple got questions? Question? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Glad to see you again this year. Um, this part that you talk about flux being fired out into space, I'm going to use the big Bedini coil in the center on the bottom. Are you talking about how that coil throws the flux out in all around it? Absolutely. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Hey, Peter. Hey, Paul. I just wanted to thank you for um, uh, keeping this uh, conversation going. And I just wanted to reiterate, having worked 18 months in John's lab every day, during 2004 and 2005, and he didn't ever try and teach me anything. And that, and, and I just, 